What if we could make computers easier to use by making them more secure? When we learn to write, we learn to write individual letters. And then after we learn some more, we learn how to write joined up, which is more fluent and quicker. Today, if you want to have internet security, if you want to protect yourself, you require a lot of tools. You need your password manager because nobody can remember all that stuff. You need your second factor authentication. You need your secure file sharing. You need your Signal, Telegram, your Keybase, your Skype, and whatever other end-to-end -end secure messaging applications uh, one person that you're talking to uh, uses. You need your Open PGP and your SMIME for the same reason. And of course, there's SSH. Isn't it time that we had joined up security? Isn't it time that all of these systems, all of these applications that already exist and the ones to come, isn't it time that they all work together as though they were one system? And isn't it time that security didn't keep falling through the cracks between the applications? as happens today. Hello, I'm Philip Hallam Baker, and this is a call for participation in the Mathematical Mesh. This is a system that I've been developing, I suppose, for 25 years since I was given the brief by Tim Berners-Lee at CERN to provide a security infrastructure for the web, and it took me a little bit longer than I expected. I've done other stuff on the way, but um, I think it's ready. And I need people to help with it because this isn't something one person can do alone. In this video, I'm going to be explaining the problems the mesh is designed to solve and establish the value proposition for the mesh. In the next video, I'm going to be talking about the deployment strategy because there's absolutely no point in trying to, you know, we've invented too much. We've got too much technology in crypto that isn't being used. The problem is deployment. The devil is in the deployment. We've got to be able to put it to use. And so I'm going to be explaining the strategy for deployment of the mesh, which is, of course, very close to the strategy we had for the web at CERN that Tim developed. And after that, I'm going to be drilling down, looking at the technology platform provided by the mesh and how that is leveraged to secure applications. So there's quite a bit of material, but obviously you don't need to uh, re watch it all. And there's also the same material uh, on paper, uh, or rather on electrons. Uh, all the specifications are on the mathmesh.com uh, website. And there's also going to be uh, more accessible um, written documentation similar to these uh, presentations. So what's the value proposition? Is it really possible to make computers easy to use by making them more secure? I mean, like, isn't security the thing that makes everybody go, ah! Well, that's why we can make computers easier to use by addressing the security issues. You know, half-baked, badly designed security is the thing that gives us the pain. Right, take passwords. The shortest password that is secure is far longer than anybody could possibly be expected to remember. If you want a secure password, 
you've got to be looking at 16, 20, 24 characters. Yeah, most, most applications won't even allow you to use passwords that long. And no, this isn't something that we can fix with a better password digest. Passwords are just terrible security. You know, it's a secret that we prove who we are by giving it away, by revealing it. That's not security. What gives us the most hassle? Well, system configuration, and especially configuration of public key cryptography. I mean, I was trying to configure Thunderbird to use SMIME Secure Mail, and the process, you know, it took me 15 minutes to go through this 13-step process. And I'm thinking, there's got to be a better way. And of course, there is. You know, with the mesh, it's a all you need to do is say, give me SMIME security. Here's the CA. Bang. It can be done. And the lesson here is that any set of instructions that can be given to a human are necessary. Get rid of them. Because humans are bad at following instructions. You know what's good? A computer. So get rid of the instruction manuals, turn them into code, and give them to the computer. Now, of course, you need a bit more glue to make that happen. And I'll explain a bit uh, more about how the mesh makes that possible. But that's the big idea. You know, instead of the humans doing the work, make the computer do the work. And it's also less hassle for engineers because, you know, writing user guides is a lot more painful than writing code. So why don't we just write code in the first place? The mesh is designed to address three key problems. It's designed to dev address device management, contact management, and data at rest. Now, the mesh is also a platform that can be applied to solve, you know, like the web, it can be applied to solve a huge range of problems. But those are the three core problems that the design is focused on. Why those three? Well, those uh, constitute my minimum viable product for a start. And they're also the three issues that gate the use of secure communications on the web today. OK, so why these three problems? Well, the first two come from public key cryptography itself. Public key cryptography makes it easy for Alice and Bob to communicate securely. So if we have Alice here and Bob here, Alice and Bob can have any form of secure conversation, pretty much, provided only two criteria are met. First of all, they both have to have a public-private key pair, and they're private key has to be on the device that they're using. Oh. Let's do it in a different color. Okay, so we've got Bob's private key. Now they both have public keys, of course. And if they're going, if Alice is going to send an encrypted email, Alice has to have Bob's public key. And if Bob is going to be able to check that the email was correctly sent, Bob has to have Alice's public signature key. And so that's the reason why device management, that is management of the private key across all of Alice's devices, and public key management, that is allowing anybody who we need to communicate with to have a verified access to the public key, those are the two problems we need to solve to make end-to-end -end secure communications possible. And if we had that, then we could all be using 
S-MIME or PGP for end-to-end -end email today. We could all be using secure end-to-end -end secure messaging with Jabber and everything else. You know, the hard part is establishing the framework of trust. Once you have that framework of trust established, the rest is fairly straightforward. You know, I won't say simple, but you know, this is a problem that is sufficiently constrained that we can write formal proofs of correctness of the protocol. And there's very, very few areas of computer science where that's even attempted. And, almost, and cryptography is pretty much the only one that I can think of where providing formal proofs has become you know, the norm for protocol design. So if we meet, if we manage the devices, manage the contacts, we can apply public key cryptography and keep everybody safe. There is one small snag, and that comes from the fact that when we first were doing public key cryptography in the late 70s, early 80s, you know, most computer users on average had less than one computer. You know, if you were at a university, typically you shared a computer with the rest of your department, sometimes the rest of the university. You know, one computer for a university of 500 people or 1,000 people, you know, wasn't unusual. You know, you know, some of the really big ones, you know, they had five or ten even. Personal computers only arrived later, and they weren't really capable of doing public key cryptography f until later still. And so when you start to read the early papers on public key cryptography, they're all talking about, you know, Alice is a Turing machine. You know, they don't even distinguish Alice from the device she's using. And the idea that Alice might have more than one computer you know, that's completely alien. The idea that Alice might be carrying the computer around in her pocket and, oh, by the way, that computer in her pocket, you know, that's a supercomputer. You know, that, very few people were thinking that. Uh, wristwatch communicators were still science fiction. So the first thing that we need to do in order to provide Alice with modern security for the modern application is we've got to take account of the fact that Alice has multiple devices and glue them all together so that she can treat them all as if they're one device rather than a disjoint set. And, you know, this is the, this is the basic... Um, this is the first thing that the mesh does. The mesh allows Alice to glue all her devices together so that they can share configuration information for you know, regular network service needs, but also for configuration of cryptography and do it according to best practices. Because, you know, if you're going to write code to do this for the user, you might as well do it as well as you possibly can. So. Once we have, so Alice starts off and she has a laptop, she has a watch, she has a phone, and all of these are joined together in a bubble that we call Alice's mesh. So this is Alice's personal mesh. Uh, and this is something that belongs to Alice. She doesn't share with anybody else, and she can use for her whole life. And this mesh can be, um, the, the devices within it can be grouped together. Uh, for convenience, we call a group of devices within a mesh an account. And so she might have a group of devices which are her personal and another group of devices which are her business. And, you know, of course, real people uh, are likely to end up having um, some group, some devices that are in both groups. And each of these accounts has a database of passwords, which we call the credential catalog, and uh, a 
password uh, database of contacts and database of devices and these databases which are called catalogs in uh, mesh parlance uh, those are used to manage Alice's devices her applications and her cryptographic capabilities and so we have one uh, architecture that applying a very small number of principles does an awful lot of different types of work for, for us. So the contact management is one part of this, uh, these capabilities. And the job of the contact management is this is where Bob's public key and Alice's and everything else is going to eventually end up after they, Alice and Bob have exchanged credentials. I'll get into uh, how that happens uh, a bit later on. So we have a contact storage capability in the mesh and we also have an infrastructure that allows us to perform contact exchange. What the mesh does not do is what SMIME and PGP do, which is to define what the trust criteria are. In that this is something that, you know, Open PGP has this idea, a oh, web of trust, it's that or nothing. And SMIME has this idea, trusted third parties, it's that or nothing. And you know what? If Alice is trying to authenticate Bob, her bank manager, well, it isn't Bob. She's actually wanting to authenticate. It's the bank. And so for that particular interaction, trusted third parties are really the way to go forward. You, know, you want to have an infrastructure that looks like the web PKI to provide that type of trust. But that type of trust is a completely different type of trust from Alice wanting to exchange credentials with Carol, who she's known for 20 years and meets every day at the park. And for that, you know, let's just bump phones, you know, or do a QR code exchange or something like that. That is the best way of doing that particular exchange. And then again, if it's Doug, her professional colleague, in a completely different country who she's never met, well, we're going to have to work out how to do this remotely. And so the mesh doesn't define one set of trust criteria. It provides an infrastructure that is neutral on how the trust is generated, and it tries to support any way at all and leave itself open so that if new ways of doing it are invented, they can be made use of. So we've got all these contacts and those now allow Alice's device to establish end-to-end -end communications with anybody who she's exchanged contacts with. We've, so, so the contact catalog and the device catalog, you know, the first two problems, uh, they provide a huge amount of leverage but they don't add a new feature to the security canon. And if I'm going to get the mesh deployed, I believe that the mesh probably needs to be doing something that nothing else that's out there in the market in an open standards-based form is currently addressing. And that you know, unique value proposition for me is data at rest security. And there's several reasons that we have chosen this. One of the most important is, well, it's technology that we already had to invent so that we can store these mesh catalogs in the cloud on an untrusted server. So I needed data at rest security in actual, you know, to meet the security goals of the mesh. You know, if I've got my password catalog and I'm storing it on a server, I do not want that server to be able to access it 
or decrypt it or have any decryption capability whatsoever. And the mesh makes that possible. The other reason for choosing data at rest security is that's where the breaches are occurring. You know, 20 out of the top data breaches in history were breaches of data at rest. The Equifax hack, the data was stored on a server. Even the DNC email attack, you know, it wasn't email intercepted in transit, it was the email stored on an email server that was the issue. And this isn't surprising because you know, we've spent the past 20 years making sure that our data in transit is secure. It's the data at rest that we've been asleep at the wheel on. Or rather, you know, maybe it's not, that's not fair in that one of the reasons that we've not addressed this problem in the past is that there was a whole bunch of really aggressive prior, uh, patent, patent claims that were filed in the 1990s. And those patents are, have fortunately expired. And, you know, this isn't unusual. Yeah, this is the whole point of patents, in, the fa in fact. You know, the point of a patent is a limited term monopoly in return for giving up your trade secret. And, you know, blockchain that everybody is talking about now, uh, invented by S Satoshi uh, Finney in, uh, uh, in 2010. No, it wasn't. Blockchain, the hash chain part, that was invented in 1990 by Harbour and Stanetta. The only reason that it boomed in 2010 was that the patent had ex come up to its 20-year expiry. And so now that we've got those patents have expired on threshold cryptography, uh, distributed key generation, and so on, we can finally do what we should have been doing for the past 25 years and putting that technology to work to provide us with security. So I've explained the why, but there's something else that we need to do. If this is going to actually work, we have to build a movement. Changing the internet is hard, and I'll be talking about that in the next podcast to lay out my deployment strategy. But the heart of the deployment strategy is you. I need people to help me. And here's the deal that I offer. I spent 20 years working as principal scientist for two of the largest certificate authorities in the industry. In fact, the, the two largest at the time I was working for them. And, you know, I I know quite a bit of security, I, I hope, what well, my employers hoped. Uh, and I'm willing to share all of that with you. And all you need to do is to keep watching these videos and liking them and subscribing to them. And I'll make more. And, you know, maybe we don't end up building the mesh. Maybe, maybe all that we end up doing is teaching more people about security and teaching more people about security about cryptography but I'm going to keep on making them and they're going to get a bit more technical as we go on and we're going to be looking at a different approach to PKI and we're going to be looking at different approaches to cryptography that you won't find in Bruce's blue book or even his red book that were published 25 years ago now but we have to do something Maybe it's not the mesh, but it has to be something. I've got to start now. So please click like, please subscribe, and please watch my next podcasts on deployment, and then we can start looking at the technical stuff. Thank you very much.